this, this sermon's been brewing for probably about two years. And actually, if I shared it two years ago, it probably would have been more stewing than brewing. Because, and, and I say that jokingly, but actually, I've been on a real journey personally of anger and needing to forgive with this sermon because of, you know, what I perceived as being let down by the church and things like that. And so this is an encouragement to you of what real love should look like in the church, but also to people outside the church. Um, I say that in all open honesty, that I'm now at a pace where I feel I can share this with the right heart. But like two years ago, I probably would have been beating the sheep. You know, I just say that, unfortunately, honestly. And uh, so hopefully, you know, I actually, even to this, this morning, I mean, I was sitting there as Camberley was sharing out of Matthew about Peter walking on the water. I was actually going, oh, I could just switch to a missions message because there'd be a perfect launch from that verse. That'd be great because this is what the Lord did with, for us in Norway. And, and actually this morning, I was actually just about to uh, print off another sermon because I was resisting even to this morning about doing this because I, you know, but the Lord kept bringing me back to it. So um, hopefully you're blessed. So turn to 1 John chapter 4. Now we'll, we'll do a bit of intro as we, before we get there. But we're going to we'll look together at 1 John chapter 4. And again, this sermon has been born out of my own personal journey um, of learning, experiencing, feeling like, you know, a couple years ago, my wife and I, our family went through probably the hardest thing we've ever had to go through in our Christian journey. I mean, even to the point where I was actually ready to kill myself. I say that in all honesty. I was, we were so, it was so dark and down. And of course it was right in the middle of lockdown, which didn't help either, you know, and it was probably the hardest thing I've ever, it was definitely the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my Christian walk. And we just felt like we were abandoned and didn't have the support that we needed. And so, like I said, if I had shared this a few years ago, I probably would have been venting. Okay. But hopefully now I'd like to think that I can share this from a pure heart. But, you know, it's, it's that thing, especially since I've done a lot of missions work, you know, Norway and Austria, Romania and different countries. You know, in the church, Calvary Chapel is guilty of this a while, as well. I think Kenny would probably share this with you. Maybe he has a better situation than most missionaries, but... Um, basically out of sight, out of mind, you know, and um, we'll help you, but there has to be a crisis first, you know, or, you know, or what may happen is um, you'll get some attention if you need the home church for some reason and like they benefit from it. If you talk to a missionary, you'll, you go through these experiences. And again, I've journeyed through this with a bit of bitterness that I needed to get over myself and, um, and, you know, or, or it's this thing of you're going through a difficult time, but you just need Jesus, so we don't want to be in the way. So we leave you just to be with Jesus. And I get that. We, I, we, one of the songs today was, it was, it's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. But how does that theology actually play out as people who are filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay. And all this applies to various situations. You know, helping, supporting somebody who's struggling. Maybe they're going through a very difficult time. Um, even simply just contacting somebody just to see how they're doing, not because you need anything from them, but just to see how they're doing, right? Uh, you know, what is actually real biblical love and how does it affect our behavior and how does that theologically play out in they just need Jesus, okay? Um, and, and, and this is not just, most of us in the church, many times we think, well, the pastor definitely needs to be better at this. You know, only if I just had more time with the pastor, I'd have a stronger walk with the Lord. No, this is for all of us. And I can assure you, I was in ministry for over 25 years. You can't, one person isn't the answer to this. Your pastor, Kenny, or wherever you're going to church, you know, the pastor's wife, they can't be that person for you all the time. We, as the church, we all have to support people as they struggle or in need or you know, that missionary care, you know, if somebody's a missionary is sent out, I think, is Camberley still, is she in here? Where is she? Yeah, you're, you're, you're considering mission work, right? Camberley still. So, you know, if the church sends her out, you need to be, there's got to be some missionary care, right? It's no out of sight, out of mind. That's not allowed. And um, so, so what I want to consider now is a few questions. 
of all of us. This isn't just for the pastor, the church leadership. This is for you and me, the church folk, all right? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? Why does God seem to be silent at times? Has anybody experienced this? We don't, I don't, you don't need to raise your hands, but I think we all would shake our head. There's times you're going through a difficult time and you're like, where is God? Why does he seem to be silent? And how, and it, this is, this plays out, how does this jive? How does God's work jive with the physical world? Meaning you and I, and how we love people, okay? So let's pray, but we're gonna consider those, those questions. And actually this, this idea of God's work and, and the physical world and our natural bodies, that this might be a good lead in for talking about heaven next week, okay? So let's pray. So Lord, we, we keep this, we commit this to you and we pray you guide us by your Holy Spirit because we wanna be learners. And we don't just want to be hearers of your word, but we actually want to be doers of it. Because that's the house that's built on the rock. And we want, me as an individual, I had to learn this. I have to change my life. We have to change our lives to really love people as you call us to love people. And our, you know, Calvary Chapel Plymouth, Calvary Chapel, Church in whole. It's just a bunch of sinners getting together who need healing, like the song we just sang, who need forgiveness, who are broken. We need you, Jesus. But this is something where I think the church needs to grow as a whole. So we just pray you got us by your spirit. Now may we be all teachable and willing to change and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. So consider for a moment, what does it mean as a Christian to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, so consider who is the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've grown up in church for a lot of years, you should have a pretty easy answer that the Holy Spirit is God. It's the third person of the Trinity, right? And, but what does it mean then for you and I to be filled with the Holy Spirit? We, I mean, think about it. Let's, God in us, God is in us. We're not God's. But God decides to give us his spirit when we become Christians and then God works through us. And what is one of the Holy Spirit's roles in the church, right? So we think about, you know, that question of out of sight, out of mind, someone's going through a difficult thing and all they need is Jesus. But how does that theologically, how does that theology practically play out? Well, Listen to John chapter 15, verse 26. This is Jesus' words about the Holy Spirit. He refers to him as the helper. This is John 15, verse 26. But when the helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So one of the key roles of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit in us, is to bring glory in fact, he says that Jesus says that later in John chapter 16, verse 14, that he will glorify me, the helper, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so think about it. When we come across somebody who's struggling or, or going through a difficult situation or just needing to reach out to somebody or our, a non-Christian neighbor or colleague. As people filled with God's spirit, as born again believers who have God's spirit in us. What do we do? We actually show up and direct people to Jesus. That's that, if, if we're directing people to anything else, that's not the Holy Spirit, right? And so, but that doesn't exclude us from showing up. I, I've actually had people tell me, well, the reason why we didn't call you and support you is because, well, we just knew you needed Jesus. But think about it. As someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, you show up and you support somebody what is happening at that moment? Jesus is working through you as the feet and hands and mouth of God to support that person. And what should you do as you physically show up to that person's place so that, that with that person and fellowship with them? What should you be encouraging them as a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit's role? Testify of Jesus, direct them to Jesus to trust the Lord, right? 
okay? But does that, that does not exclude us from showing up, right? So as people fill with the Holy Spirit, yeah, this falls on, goes on to the next question, okay? Why does God seem silent sometimes when we're going through a difficult time? And this is a real theological thing we need to wrestle with. You read through the Psalms, just read through the Psalms. You know, sometimes you have people just expressing their heart. They might not be necessarily theological, theologically accurate all the time. It's because they're, they're crying out, okay? And you read through the Psalms, listen to Psalm chapter 10, verse one. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? So these are, you know, these were the psalmist writings. They're wrestling with this. They're going through a difficult time. They, they felt like God was silent. He was absent. Where is he? Now, I wonder. I wonder. Maybe God seems silent. It's because we're silent. Because we're not showing up when we should. Think about it. As people fill with the Holy Spirit, where should we be when we come across somebody who's struggling or, or going through a very difficult time? How do we bring Jesus into that situation? Yes, I agree with all, theologically, we need, they need Jesus. That's where their hope needs to lie. But practically, how does that play out? Why does God seem silent in that time? Is it because we're not showing up, the church isn't showing up and supporting that person as spirit-filled people? Possibly, possibly. Maybe God seems silent many times because we're silent, not showing up as we should. Now, let's look at 1 John chapter 4. This is where I want you to see the heart of God, okay, in this, in this idea. Verse 7. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So here's, here's the context. We... We're being commanded by John to love each other. All right, well, how did, how did that, how did God show his love? Okay, so verse eight, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this we love, excuse me, in, in this the love of God was manifested to us, for us. So how did God show his love? In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that way might live through him. So how did God show his love towards us? How did God show us how we're supposed to love others? God came down into our situation and joined our struggle. He sent his son to us into the world. God didn't stand up in a spaceship, in, a, in an astronaut suit, immune from this world and the struggles and the, the pains of this world, God himself came down into the world and shared in our battles and our struggles, even the point of death. You know, the whole question about the problem of evil and suffering and why God allows it, a lot of times the first thing I say is before we get into all the philosophical answers and theological answers, can I just say that God himself suffered? You know, that's a very powerful aspect of the gospel. I know you're going through a very difficult time. Do you know that God knows exactly what you're going through? No other religion gets that. The God of the universe, the creator of the universe actually suffered. He was felt abandoned. He was betrayed. He was physically abused. He was relationally abused. He was rejected. His friends, the people who were supposed to be there alongside took off on him. Can we relate? Yeah, God himself has been through all this, but God, in, in expressing his love, sent his son to be to us, to be with us through it. And it goes on to say there in verse uh, nine, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only son, begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what did God do to prove his love? He sacrificially sent his son into the world. And so he says, that's what we need to do. We need to sacrificially love. And look at verse 12, this is very interesting. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, 
God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. What is, what is John saying here? How does a vis invisible God become visible? Us. As spirit-filled people, God living in us by, through his Holy Spirit, the invisible God becomes visible as we sacrificially love other people and show up when they're going through a difficult time. I, I, you know, many times I think, and this has been in, in my journey of learning about heaven and all this sort of stuff, because, uh, you know, a lot of people, even in Calvary, you know, where we, our bread and butter is teaching the Bible, we sometimes have this misunderstanding of heaven and, or, or misunderstanding of the natural world. Okay? You know, a lot of times we think God shows up all of a sudden, you know, the big lightning bolt experiences, the supernatural things, kind of busting eardrums and all that kind of stuff. And every once in a while we read through scripture and that sort of thing does happen. But I don't think we give the natural world credit enough, meaning um, how much our physical presence means. You know, we want we want the supernatural to show up and leave marks and, you know, bust through in the, you know, the natural world so many times. But God doesn't do that very often, actually. Very rarely do you see that in scripture. We're always separating the natural and supernatural. In fact, you know, you, you know, in Acts chapter 10. Do you remember the angel shows up to Peter? Remember an angel shows up to, um, who was the Cornelius? Was it Cornelius? And he shows up to Peter and they're both told, by the way, Peter, you need to go to Cornelius. And Cornelius, by the way, you need to host Peter and listen to him. Now, wouldn't it have been more powerful if the angel just showed up to the little group in Cornelius' home and just said, believe in Jesus? Wouldn't that have been a little bit more powerful? But that would have been the big supernatural thing we had hoped, but what did God do? He worked through the natural, the physical, and sent Peter. I would have rather seen the angel. That would have been cool, right? But God is constantly trying to bring these, the supernatural and the natural together. In fact, where did God actually intend to spend forever with people? Go all the way back to Genesis 1. It was, in, it was in the world, in the Garden of Eden. You go back to Genesis 1, you get the six days of creation. What happens and what, how did he end every day of creation? Well, he walked, he walked in the cool day with his people, right? But every day ended with, and there was morning and evening the first day or the second day, the third day. But if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and then get into chapter 2, the first three verses, it's the seventh day. There's no morning and evening. There's no end to the day. Because that day God intended before sin that, that he was going to spend forever with everybody. Right? That was the day it was complete. He rested that day. It's not like God was tired. Well, I've created for six days now. God, I'm shattered. I've got to take a break. These people are so much work, you know. But, you know, he, basically the whole buildup, you get to the end of chapter one. He created mankind, you and I. And he, he, was, he was resting. He, it was like a word of celebration. This is great. It's, it, it's like I remember going when I first had my daughter, Sarah, my oldest daughter. And she's laying in my lap. First child. She's a little, little squirt. Teeny little thing. And you're sitting there going, oh my, what do I do now? But there was, there was that feeling of, oh my, now what? As a dad, I, I don't know what I'm doing. But there was also that feeling of, I can't. Imagine I get to express my love in a new way to this beautiful creation, right? And I can imagine that's how God felt. At the end of creation, he, it was like it built up to us being created, mankind being created. And God was like, I get to express my love in a new way. And then we get to day seven. No morning, no evening. It was just supposed to, that's where he intended. We talk about the problem of evil and suffering. What was God's will? Day seven. That day of peace. Prosperity rests with his creation and just walking together and being together. That was God's will, where there was no death, no suffering. But where was that? In a natural, physical world. The same world we're living in today that's now broken. Where are we going to spend eternity? In an actual, physical, real world. We'll talk about that next week. It's clear in Scripture, okay? 
So we, you know, we're always trying to separate the supernatural from the natural, but actually what God does is he brings it together. I mean, think about it. How many, I guarantee you, I don't know, can you feel, see good sunrises or sunsets from here? I mean, you must, you got this great view. But I mean, I've sitting there as, as I came into the bar and I even said to Phil, not a bad view, buddy, right? And, uh, you know, but you know, you've ever been on that walk and you're just seeing this beautiful countryside. As Christians, what does that generally lead us to do? Worship. Or you see that beautiful sunrise or that beautiful sunset. You're like, wow, God, you're cool. You're a great art artist. You know, in Psalm 19, that's what it says. You know, the whole psalmist was writing going, the heavens declare the glory of God. And we're supposed to look at creation, the physical created world, the natural world. And it's supposed to join the natural and the supernatural. It's supposed to bring it together. We're supposed to praise God. Think about Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down on everybody, very supernatural event, wasn't it? Completely supernatural. But how does it play out? People speaking known languages and God got glory. It happened in the natural, known languages, right? I mean, think about it. When we get saved, the spiritual world and the natural body come together. God lives in us. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, he operates through our physical bodies. I mean, think about it. How did God communicate his supernatural love? We just read this in one John, didn't we? How did he communicate his supernatural love? He came down in a physical body, right? He combined the supernatural and the natural. Communication, God's communication of his love happened best and most effective when it happened in the, in the natural world. Colossians chapter one, verse 19 and 20. God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and Jesus and through him reconcile all things. Right? I mean, think about it. What is the real miracle? The real supernatural miracle? It's our bodies being filled with God's spirit. I mean, think about it. Step back from it and go, how incredible that is. How absolutely supernatural, how miraculous that is, that God chooses, this perfect holy God chooses to put himself in us, in the person of his Holy Spirit, and then use us for his glory. And, and you know, very rarely, you, every once in a while you hear a missionary story of an angel showing up and testifying of Jesus. You know, you, you know I, I, when we were living in Norway, we got to Norway and we had all these plans what we we're going to do. The, the biggest ministry he did was ministering to refugees from Africa and the Middle East, because all hell broke loose in the Middle East and Syria, and they all started coming to Norway for some reason. All these poor Syrian men, you know, used to this warm climate, all of a sudden came to Norway, these poor men dealing with minus 20, 30 degrees in the winter. But it was an incredible ministry, and I was meeting guys who actually had dreams and visions of the Lord and got saved. But very rarely does that happen. Most of the time, he uses broken people like you and I. But it's the miracle, the miracle of God's spirit working in us. The supernatural working through the natural. Right? And then what happens is that ordinary human acts of kindness and love become experiences of God on earth. You know, people who are struggling, you know, they experience God's presence as we behave like him. You know, God isn't silent when we actually show up and let the Holy Spirit work through us. And you know, and that's what satisfies our deepest need is, a, is, an, ex, is an experiential physical touch of God as we show up filled with the Holy Spirit and bring Jesus to people. But we have to show up. Now, I, I like reading a lot of Phyllis philosophical books, apologetic stuff. I do recommend a book by Peter Kreft, uh, Making Sense Out of Suffering. And, uh, and of course, he was answering the question, well, what, what does a person need? What is the answer for a person who's going through a difficult time? And most times, there is no answer. We can't really give them an answer. We can't say, well, this is what God's doing in your life. This is why it's happening. The answer is a person, Jesus. There's no doubt about that. But th this is what he says. I'm not quoting from his book, Making Sense Out of Suffering. In the end, God has only given us 
partial explanations. Maybe that's because he saw that a better explanation wouldn't have been good for us. I don't know why, as a, as a philosopher, I'm obviously curious. Humanly, I wish he had given us more information, but he knew Jesus was more than an explanation. He's what we really need. If your friend is sick and dying, the most important thing he wants is not an explanation. He wants you to sit with him or her. He's terrified of being alone more than anything else. So God has not left us alone. But in his years of studying philosophy and theology and all this sort of stuff, and his talking to people who's gone through suffering and struggles, the most important thing they need is not necessarily an explanation because we don't have it necessarily. What they need is you and me showing up, being there alongside them. And so now I want, what I'd like to do in turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is let's just take a, a rocket look through the scriptures, all right, about what it means to really love people. A little quick look. And these, these verses put us in various scenarios. Maybe it's supporting people who've stumbled into sin. Maybe it's supporting people practically, you know, financially or emotional needs. Maybe there's some spiritual needs, but let's see if we can find what is the common denominator in all these situations. So first thing we're going to do is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me get there as well. And you guys know these verses. It's the God of all comfort verses. Two Corinthians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Now think about step, pause for a moment. How does God comfort us? Maybe it's through prayer, maybe it's a Bible verse that encourages us or we're going through a difficult time and he gives us a promise in his word. But many times, you and, I, you and I both know how it happens. How does God comfort us? He brings somebody alongside us to encourage us and to fellowship and to support us. Maybe a, a, a listener, someone who can listen to what we're going through. And maybe they give us a verse. You know, or maybe they, you know, they're, they're doing, you know, as people filled with the Holy Spirit, they... They, um, they direct us to Jesus. But why does God do this? Why does he comfort us? Look at the rest of verse 4. That, uh, verse 4. Who comforts us in all of our tribulation, our troubles, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, who has ever been comforted by God? I think we all could put our hands up and say, we got plenty of stories where God is in a difficult situation or a scary situation, whatever it is, God's come in and given us a promise, a verse, or sent somebody to comfort us, to bring God's comfort to us. But then what are, what are we supposed to do with that? We're supposed to show up and be a tool of God to comfort other people with what we've learned, right? And many times someone's opening and sharing their heart with you and you realize, oh my gosh, God did this exact same thing in my heart two, three years ago, and let me, let me just share my story with you. But what did it not exclude? You and me, right? Go to Galatians chapter six. And we, we know these verses, somebody who's struggling with sin, maybe they've stumbled into sin, they've fallen, and Paul says we're supposed to come alongside them, not judge them, but support them and restore them. But let's step back for a moment and actually look at the context of Galatians chapter 6. If you look at chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For all the law, so you think about all the Old Testament law, all the books of the Torah, five books of Moses, all that sort, all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
okay? It's all about loving people. And then interesting, anybody, what goes in after that? If you read through verse 16 into the, the end of chapter 5, particularly verse 22 to 26, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Interesting. This is how we should be behaved as people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the first word? Love. The fruits of the Spirit is love. And then we get to chapter 6, verse 1, where it says, Brethren, you're, this is how you love people. This is what it means to walk in the Spirit, to love others. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, so they've stumbled into sin, they're, they're, they're struggling, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What does that require? How do we bear someone's burdens? We show up and graciously, without judgment, walk alongside them through their struggle. Whether it's false, sinful struggle, or maybe it's a, an emotional struggle, or they're going through a difficult time, maybe it's a sickness. We show up and we bear the burden with them. There's a physical presence required. How did Jesus show up in this situation? You and me, right? Go to Philippians chapter four. And this, this is where, you know, Paul, believe it or not, the apostle Paul, we think, oh, he didn't need any support. He had his act together, right? He just, you know, what sort of support did he need? Do you know, let's, chapter four, verse one. This is kind of like, if you think about Philippians, this is kind of like ooh, the pinnacle point where Paul really gets all excited about this church. And he says, chapter four, verse one, therefore my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. He never says this to any other church. He only says this to the church in Philippi. My beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown. To the Apostle Paul, the Philippian church was his crowning achievement. There, there was something they did. They got it. And Paul was like, yeah, I wish every other church could be like you. When, when I think of you, you are my crown and you're, you're, you're my best achievement. You are what I really intended the church to be. Pretty powerful words. He never says this to anybody, any other church. Okay. Now, you know, there was something that Paul valued in this church above all other churches. Now, go back to chapter 25, or sorry, chapter 3, verse 25. Sorry, I wrote chapter 3, verse 25, but that's actually not the right text. Uh, it's 225, sorry. I have it wrong in my notes here. So keep in mind, Paul was a missionary. He was traveling all over. Greece and Europe, um, you know, Asia Minor, Turkey today, and Greece. And he was just walking by faith, preaching the gospel, starting churches, church planting all over the place. But there was something about this Philippian church that they got, that Paul needed support as well. Now, I say this with the purest of heart. I used to, and I, I'll be honest with you, I used to be really angry about this and bitter about this. But you know, when I when it's doing the mission work, basically out of sight, out of mind, no one really cared until if, if I didn't call my home church, if I didn't call, they, nothing, nothing. But if you needed somebody, like let's say you put on a conference or you put on some sort of outreach and then, then they were interested because then they could come and take photos and you needed them. And there was something to give them value. Now, this is common. And again, I share this with a pure heart, but this is typical. But look, look what this church did. Look what the Philippian church did. Look at verse 25. Chapter 2, verse 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker. So Paul's sending him back to Philippi. Right? Uh, 
So I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should sorrow, ha lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his own life, but to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. The Philippian church sent Epaphroditus to Paul just to bless Paul. There was no, no, no asking anything back. He went there to minister to Paul's needs. Wasn't there to take photos or do a conference or, you know, let me do some teaching so that I can, I can, you know, show my value. Epaphroditus, the church has said, they just saw the value in Paul and just sending somebody to bless him. So important. Have you, do you just call people just to check it? How are they, how are you doing? I don't need anything from you. How are you doing? Hey, uh, What's up with the church? Is everything all right? You doing okay? Is there a new way we can pray for you? You know, just being there, showing up, taking the initiative. You know, I, I was actually, we had some friends and it was really funny because, you know, guys are really bad at this, to be honest with you. And, and, le and let me just say with all humility, I had to learn this myself. Number one, to be a better listener. And also, I used to get really upset because all my, you know, I have some good friends in New York. We lived there for 10 years. They never contact me. I always contact them. And I, and I used to get really upset about that. I'm just, I'm fine. But it just, my friend and I were chatting about it this weekend. And we we're just like, just got to get over ourselves and just do it. Men, you know, men are horrible. But just to call people, not because we need anything from you. Don't need a place to stay. Don't need anything. Not going to come over to your house for a meal. Just, how are you doing? Are you all right? How can we pray for you? Right? And that's, this is with this church heart. We're just going to send a paphroditus to you just to bless you. Right? And we don't need anything in return. Just want to meet your needs, Paul. And then flip over to chapter four. I'm going to move a little quicker here. Verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Right? Not that I speak in regards to need, for I've learned that in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to be abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. You know what that word for shared is? The root word? Koinonia. Do you know what that word is? Where we? Fellowship. Now, how do we generally think of fellowship? Hanging out together, let's go get a meal. That's true. But here, that koinonia, sharing, partnering with Paul's distress, his troubles, being involved, being there to support. It goes on um, in verse, uh, verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed, from Macedonia, no church shared koinonia with me concerning giving or receiving, but you only. So they financially supported him as well. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek uh, the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound and I am full, having received from you Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to your glorious riches in Christ. It's interesting. We love that verse. How many have that verse on their wall somewhere or their fridge, a fridge matter? And God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. But actually, what's the context of that promise? Being generous. Being generous with our resources and our time and our, our life. That's the context of that promise. And this Philippian church, they were doing that. 
They saw Paul in his ministry. They saw the value as a person and his ministry. And we're going to invest and we're going to give sacrificially. And Paul saw this church then as his crowning achievement. Because they, 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 they thought bigger than themselves. And they gave sacrificially. Flip over to James. Actually, go to 1 John because we're, I, I need to finish. We're just going to go to 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse 16. 1 John chapter 3 verse 16. Now, this is, by this we know love. Right? Ears? Okay. By this we know love. So we... Very clear statement of how to love people. By this we know love, because he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So how does how do we love? Well, God showed it to us sacrificially. Now we may not have to physically lay down our lives for each other in regards to death, but we are called to live sacrificially love as Jesus did. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. Now, let's see how this practically plays out. This truth plays out. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So listen, basically what John is saying is, if you're going to tell me you love me, but do nothing about it, then it's shallow and hollow. There needs to be a practical outplaying of our love. We need to, it, it, basically, John says, if you, if, if you just say you love me, but you don't do anything about it, it's empty. Real sacrificial love plays out practically. In this particular case, it appears um, that you see somebody in practical need, financial or food or whatever. You have those resources, meet the need. Right? Do it. And it's actually, we're obligated in a sense. Because back in verse 16, he says, and this is how we ought to not think about it. This is how we ought to love others. Okay. So how did Jesus show up here? Like any of the other verses, someone showed up and expressed his love physically, practically. In this particular case, maybe it was meeting a financial need or a material need. But listen, I think there's some really important principles in this verse, and this is where we'll close. This verse also gives some understanding of when we should act in love with somebody. Okay, did you see that in verse 17? It says, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need. So what two principles there trigger our action? What's that? Okay, so whoever has the resources, so whoever, it says there, look at verse 17, whoever has this world's goods, and then what? Sees the need. So you have the resources, and God reveals the need to you, because not everyone, you know, maybe there's somebody in need in the church, and God reveals it to you, but the whole church doesn't know about it. So what is that, then what ought we do? meet the need if we have the resources, okay? So those are the two things, you know, people say, well, I mean, there's so much need in the world, how can it? Well, has God revealed it to you? Has he revealed that you should be meeting this need? We obviously can't meet. Number one, we have to have the resources, okay? If you don't have the resources, then God hasn't called you to meet that need. But if you have the resources and he revealed the need to you, we ought to act, and that's real love, okay? And so, but let's, let's step back for a moment. Forget about it being financial or material need. Let's just think about any particular need. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's someone's going through a difficult time. They're suffering. They got a sickness or something, right? Do we have the resources? We do, we have the time. We can physically show up and support that person. We have the ears, we have ears, right? And you know, listen, to be fair to Calvary Chapel, how has God really used Calvary Chapel over the years? Many of you might be new to Calvary Chapel, but since the 60s, we've been a Bible teaching ministry. 
That's our bread and butter, right? And that's wonderful. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But be honest with you, to be fair, and I, and this is me as well. This is where I've had to adjust. I have to force myself to be a good listener because I've been used for so many years as a talker, as a teacher, and Calvary pastors and leaders have been used so well, greatly, and this is all wonderful, as Bible teachers. So we've been conditioned to talk to you all the time. And we've actually become, and I, me as well, become really bad listeners. It's, it's true, unfortunately. Maybe Kenny and Missy are really good at this. I don't know. But, but I'm just saying this. You know, we're, Calvary's answer to everything is start a new Bible study. It, it many, many times. Right? And so, to be fair, I mean, you know, but God has used Calvary Chapel and other churches as t- a teaching Bible teaching ministry, and it's been used in a great way. So I'm not faulting anything, but the consequence of that is you're going through a difficult time. Let me give you a Bible verse. I'm going to teach you something, right? And what does James actually say? Shut up. He says in James chapter one, verse 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, right? And that's what I'm really working on with my kids, with people. You, you know, they come to you, they're going through a difficult time. Oh, well, I know the Bible really well. Here's an answer, right? And, and as a man, we tend to want to fix things, right? Right? You know, sometimes I say to my wife, do you need me to fix this or you just want me to listen? Just tell me, you know, tell me straight. You know, and many times she says, you know, just, just listen. I, she knows all the answers. She knows the Bible. Well, you know, it's like, you know, and many times, you know, we just go into preach mode. But really what people need is just to be listened to. And, and actually, you know, you, you think about the book of Job. Let's look big picture at Job. Okay. You know, people get caught up with the whole problem of evil and suffering. Oh my gosh, what Job went through. And keep in mind, we know chapter one and two of Job. You know, that whole conversation between the Satan, the, the um, you know, the, um, Satan and God and, you know, and really what was at stake there was the value of God because, you know, the Satan kept saying to God, well, the only reason he worships you is because you've blessed him so much. And then he was able to take all that away. God gave him permission. And then the only reason he still worships you and, ble- and, you know, follows you is because you've protected him physically. He said, okay, you can let him be sick, right? You, but you can't kill him, but you can touch his body and he got the boils and all that sort of stuff. What was really at stake was the value of God. Why was Job worshiping God? Was it because God looked after him and blessed him so much? Because of what Job got from God? Or is it simply just the value of God? That was what was at stake. So keep in mind, we know chapter 1 and 2. Job didn't. Job didn't know that conversation. And then you watch Job's process. You read chapter 3 through 37. All the conversation in between. Job, one moment, is praising God. Blessed be God. He gives and takes away. Oh, you know, um, uh, he purifies me and all this wonderful stuff, you know. Though, I'm, though he, he kill me, yet I'll praise him. But then also there's points where I just want to be dead. I wish I was never born. And then there's also points where he's accusing God. I want a court case with God. I want to prove that this is not justified. This is wrong. He went through this whole range of emotions. And you know what was happening in the midst of all that? The friends were giving him really bad advice. But, you know, go to chapter two, Job chapter two. And this is where we'll finish. I know I've been saying finish, finish, finish. Okay, sorry, forgive me. But I'm, I'm excited about this. One. Look at verse 11. And this is, let, let me ask you a question. Why don't you show up when someone's really suffering? Why don't you go? Think about it for a moment. Why do you hesitate when someone's going through a really difficult time? They've been just diagnosed with something. Maybe they just lost. Someone just died really close to them. Why don't you go? Many times it's because you don't know what to say. Or maybe I'll say the wrong thing, right? Well, look at, look at Job chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all the adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. What did they do? They showed up physically, okay? They became aware of Job's situation and they showed up. Look at the end of verse 11, all right? For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. 
So we, de we tend to bash these guys because as you get into the rest of the book, they're, they're giving some bad advice and misrepresenting God. But, but here they got it right. They show up, they come from distance, they show up, they, um, they make a plan and they go, what do they do? They go and mourn with him. And it says in verse 13, they sat down with him seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him for they saw his grief was very great. This is amazing. There's a lot. This is, this is the answer to the problem of evil and suffering. When someone's going through a difficult time, show up, make a plan, talk with people. We need to support them. Let's make a plan and then go there and don't say a word. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to preach. You don't need to give them a verse. Just sit there and mourn with them. And they got it right. The problem, so you know, the answer is, what do I say? I don't know, I, I, I don't wanna show up. Show up, go with the plan of just listening. Don't put the pressure on yourself of figuring it all, out, it all out for them. You don't have to. You don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. Just be there with them. And mourn, mourn. Jesus says, mourn with those who mourn, right? The problem is, is they started talking and that's when they got in trouble, right? So all this to say, you are filled with God's spirit. God wants to use you to come alongside people. How we really love people is you being filled with God's spirit, showing up and supporting people. Even if you get nothing in return, that's what the church is called to. And, and being safe. What You know what Job needed? He needed somebody to sit there quietly and let him go through the whole range of emotions. Are you a safe person? Would, would, would that person feel safe with you or me to go through the range of emotions Job went through? One moment, I want to be dead. Just kill me. I want to put a bullet through my head. Next moment, praise God. He's, everything's under control. I'm going to trust him. The next moment, God, I'm sick of this. I'm so mad at you. Why are you allowing this happen? Are you, that's, read it. Chapter 3 through 37, you'll see all this. That's the value for us. We could, when you go through a difficult time, you go through those arranged emotions. I go through those arranged emotions as well. The thing is, is for us to really love people, is come alongside them, no judgment, and support them quietly right? And be that safe person.